Today we're going to go through a little bit about how we got the mummy and what we're now doing with her and the role of preservation that we're doing as an institution as a keeper. This is Egypt from space and uh, the story starts, believe it or not, with Napoleon because he's responsible for making the world be obsessed with all things Egyptian. When he went to go and capture Egypt to control the British, um, control of the Middle East and the Mediterranean, uh, he took 150 savants with him. These were engineers, architects, artists, uh, botanists, and he wanted to document Egypt and produce a series of books which would end up being 23 volumes, 43 inches tall per book with these amazing engravings and images of Egypt. The savants actually had to smuggle them out of Egypt because Napoleon took a quick skedaddle when he lost to the British and he left behind much of his army and the savants to find their way home. They had to smuggle out their drawings. They had to um, keep the British from getting a hold of them because the British got all the artifacts that they had collected. And if you want to go see them, you can go to the British Museum because they collected almost all of Napoleon's treasured artifacts, except for the head of a, an Egyptian woman, um, a mummified, that he sent to his wife. Everything else went to the Brits. <laughs> I'm not sure why a woman would want to have a mummified head, um, but that was the case. The little spot, I'm gonna give you a little orientation before we move away from this image. This little green area right here is Fayum. Cairo's up about there, and Luxor is down here, and this will become important later on, just so you get a bearing. So, now we'll do this right. Um, when the mania for Egyptian artifacts didn't end just with the study of the ancients, there started to become another movement to be able to get the souls of Egyptian people saved to Christianity. And Kreuzer Seminary is in Upland, Pennsylvania, and they established schools to train ministers um, and missionaries to be able to uh, help settle and civilize the West of America that was expanding, but then also to send missionaries to um, China, India, and Egypt. And though we don't know his name, there was a missionary that had been sent to Luxor. And he stayed there in the late 1890s to the very early 1900s. We know that um, he was back by 1906 and he brought with them a mummy. It was his gift to, the, to his um, education that he received from Crozer, and it also was to go to the museum to help train future missionaries in the culture and the beliefs of the people that they would be meeting. This is the mummy he brought back. Now, it would stay with Crozer until 1957, when they decided they didn't need to keep these collections anymore. And they made them available by announcing to museums around the United States that there was a collection there that they could come to and select items that they would like to take back to their own museums. And Statesville had just formed a museum. It was called the Iredell Museum of Arts and Heritage. It's today the Iredell Museums. And they went up, there was actually 20 mummies in their collection and they decided on this one. This is um, affectionately called in Statesville Margaret, so if I happen to slip up and say Margaret, understand I'm speaking about her. This is a cartonnage. Um, it is kind of like a, I call it a cocoon. It's made of linen with plaster and resin. And this is done like a, a paper mache. Uh, layers and layers and smoothing it down. And these were actually done over earthen made forms um, in the shape of the mummy to be covered. And then the two separate parts are joined together, 
plastered again, and then once it's dried, they cut a slit in the back and slip the mummy inside it and seal the back, and that's her first coffin. She's part of what's called an ensemble, and it includes the cartonnage and two outer coffins that protect it. Now, unfortunately, the missionary probably didn't acquire this mummy on the complete up and up, because at that time, looting was rampant. And so because of the looting, they likely just had it come from um, a street vendor that would just sell the mummies propped up against buildings, or it could be from an antiquities dealer who bought it from the, the street vendor and, and spruced it up a bit and then put it up for, for market. Um, we still can be able to find out history just by looking at the mummy itself. And one of the important things is these little hands. You notice the blue and red checkerboard effect on the back of the hands. This is characteristic of mummies from the 22nd dynasty. And we were blessed to have a board member spend over a year in London doing research at the British Museum, looking at mummies in their collection, and meeting with Dr. Taylor, who was the 22nd Dynasty Specialist of the British Collection. And he told us that this is definitely from the 22nd Dynasty. The other factor is the coloration of the turquoise blue, russet red, and kind of a yellow beigey um, cream-like decoration over a white field. So this um, design says Fayum um, in the colors, and the hands tell us 22nd Dynasty. Now, the next thing that's important to it is this area, and we're going to see it in more detail. Um, this is a god called Cahun. Kanum. Kanum is one of the most ancient gods of Egypt. They accredit this figure to be the, the builder of the Nile, and he also has a role of the fertility of the fields and agriculture. And so this, this figurine um, is surrounded also by the four sons of Horus, which are right along here. Now each of them carries a feather, and that feather says that um, it, it's the feather of Isis, and it will actually uh, weigh the heart. And if, if the feather and the heart stay even on a scale, she can go to her afterlife. If it doesn't, she gets thrown to a half crocodile, half hippo. I love Egyptian gods. They're, it's a fantasy that beyond all. Now, this, these will help guide her to her afterlife and will be there to um, assist her if she passes the feather test. There's some interesting things, though, about this as well. Because this god also has strong associations with Ra, it bears the symbol of the sun disk. Um, and he's given, for some inexplicable reasons, wings and tail feathers and bird claws that are holding um, fertility symbols and eternity symbols. So this is the front of her cartonnage, and the cartonnage is supposed to represent what the person actually looked like as best as possible. But there'll be some reasons why we really doubt this. It could just be a general rendering. This big part of the body of the god could have held a carton, uh, what's called a, um, a symbol disc that gives their names. Uh, she does not have her name on this coffin. And in true uh, mythology of, of the dead, that means she's not going to her afterlife. And this is confusing. Um, most of the um, mummies from this time period have their name right up at the neck and it tells their name and what they did. Uh, we, we've been looking at one mummy that um, her name is there and says she was the chantress of Luhan Temple. 
and so you know where she's from. We don't know anything about her on this one, though the car cartonnage is, in fact, from the period. So you have the feathers, you have the sun disk, and you have Cahoon. This is her second coffin, and it's made out of cedar from Lebanon, and it is, she has a headdress um, of eagle wings, um, which you see the pharaoh wearing it sometimes. There's also braids of her wig coming down. Um, Egyptians had a real problem with head lice. They shaved their heads and they wore wigs, and if they had wealth, they had elaborate wigs and elaborate de decorations to them. This is the um, third and outer coffin. Now, to have three coffins, the cartonnage and the, and the two wooden coffins, really suggests that this woman came from the elite society. And elite society in Egypt is the top uh, 8%, and, and she is definitely fit into this. This cedar wood came from Lebanon and was imported, and it was incredibly expensive. And it showed um, not only uh, for the protection of her afterlife, but as a little bit of a status seeking, as this, this mummy would be paraded to her funeral site and her friends would follow in mourning. Um, you can see the piecing inside that center base. Um, Lebanon cedars are sacred, and only the smaller trees are cut. Once they start getting to a certain size, they can't be cut. It was con it's considered sacrilegious. So for her, these panels um, that are pegged together to make it are um, a, a very expensive component of what she had to do and prepare for her funeral. And people did this from the very beginning of their life. If you were fairer, they immediately started constructing your, your pyramid or your tomb. And for a woman of her stature, she would be putting away money for the 700 pounds of salt, the 15 yards of linen, um, the frankincense and myrrh that even today still commands the price of $176 for three ounces. This was an expensive process. And so the fact that, that she has done this, and I want you to be able to see over here the layers of wood that were prepared and these little pegs that put them all together along the coffin lid. And last but not least, the prayers that are written down each of the coffins and their matching selections. These were taken from the Book of the Dead. And the hieroglyphs, hieroglyphs on this one, you see um, Anubis up there at the top of it, and then proceeding down a ribbon. Each of these ribbons have like the first four or five words written in hieroglyphics for the prayer. It's kind of like if you say, Our Father who art in heaven, you probably know the rest of that prayer. It was the same true for the Book of the Dead, except they had 3,000 prayers to guide you to your afterlife. And so she picked the favorite, or the um, embalmer did it for her, and she would, those would be painted on every one of the coffins. Now, for us today, the challenge is keeping her and protecting her as much as possible. She was shipped from Egypt to Pennsylvania, the port of Pennsylvania, uh, Philadelphia. Um, and it, if you've ever seen a steamador load a ship, she took quite a ride, and that had an impact on her. And you can see the split at the top of the head of the cartonnage. They've actually drilled holes and we've done lacings to keep attention so that the split doesn't continue to go down her face. And her face is made of wood. It is, um, carved and applied onto the cartonnage surface, and sometime in her travels in the past, her face took a hard blow, and it actually broke the, the, through the cartonnage, and you could lift off the face and peek inside. That was all repaired by a conservator. X-rays are one of our key tools um, in monitoring her status, and here's, um, uh, both CT scan and x-ray room 
just this, earlier this year. These are the results, and we found some rather interesting things about Margaret. Her hands are in a lower position, so she was, we were told she was a princess, but that's not a position for a princess. They were up here. And so, in this case, the arms are coming down, and that confirms that she's in the elite, but not royal. The other is the jawbone that's there, and that's all of the head we have. Now, this could happen a lot of different ways. The fact that she took a blow to the face and you could lift it off means the, the head could possibly have just gone off into the distance. The other is that occasionally embalmers would take bones from other mummies to complete the set. And it didn't even matter if it was a man or a woman. So that's another case. And then these are some of the new tools that we're using. Dendrochronology can help date the wood, the coffin. We would like to do carbon dating, but it's expensive, and we're raising funds to be able to do that, and that would narrow down the date. The most exciting one that's coming is satellite archaeology. From space, they're identifying locations where additional dig sites can be done, and we're very excited about that because they found more pyramids and more necropolises from space near the area where we think she came from. And while we were researching that, we found an image of a mummy that's very much like ours. And it was found near Lahoon, and this is in a necropolis with a crypt space. And that is, we're waiting on her to tell us the next story. I thank you very much. <laughs>